Okay, and welcome back. Hour number three on this Monday night, and most of you know what that means. It means we're going to take a look at the extinction event, which has begun now in earnest in the Northern Hemisphere, the constant stream of radioactivity coming over from Fukushima, and there was a typhoon that hit northeast Japan a week ago, and they announced shortly thereafter that the famous ice wall at Fukushima Daiichi had failed and that an enormous amount of radioactive water, which had, strangely enough, been built up back behind that wall, was now flowing through it and into the ocean, non-stop. Where did they think that water was going to go? It just backed up and backed up and broke through with the help of the typhoon. So now we have an enormous new injection of radiation into the Pacific, which is already, as we know, uh, virtually dead. In most places, there are some pockets, remember, still remaining, where things can appear to the casual observer to be relatively normal, but they're not. All right, I'm going to bring our two regulars on, and we have a special guest I'm going to go to as well. Uh, Yoshi, are you there? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm available today. Yeah, thank you. All right, are you, you're still somewhere in... The other hemisphere. Well, I'm, uh, I'm in Thailand. I'm back in Thailand. You know, it's uh, uh, Asia is a big market, but it's yeah. dying on the vine right now. You know, the yeah. economies are dying, just like the U.S. is actually. Uh, it's a it's a global you know, it's, it's a global I, economy. It yeah, is. it's all over Europe is down. It, it's uh, all of these uh, insane policies have just uh, accelerated the economic uh, you know problems that yep. Yep. Uh, advanced industrial societies have, and it's just spilling over to everywhere else. All right, let's go oh, up yeah. to uh, B.C. and uh, say hello to Dana. Dana Durnford, our uh, our hero, navigator, and uh, just tireless you, researcher who has been the one who really first revealed the fact that an extinction event had begun in British Columbia, and now it has spread all over the place. You there, Dana? Yeah, it's just like the cancer in the muscles. It's all over the place. Now, what he's saying, cancer in the muscles, uh, we're talking about muscles like clams, like bivalves, and what they have found, they being scientists, apparently honorable ones because they reveal this, is that for the first time in history, cancer apparently is not a self-limiting disease. It's contagious. They have found in the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic on both sides cancerous cells which are infectious. I, I laugh every time I hear that. <laughs> Sorry, because it's so ludicrous, but yet there it is. Imagine, but, if you will, leukemia. You, you know someone seafood. who's got yeah. You know someone who's got cancer, and all of a sudden, you can get it. It's contagious. It can be vectored by anyone with it to someone who doesn't have it. You know what that would mean? That would mean that no longer would one out of two people develop cancer. That would mean everybody gets it. So this is a major uh, development in the breakdown of our whole biosphere. Cancer is now in the ocean, in cells, literally floating well, around looking for well, a host. You should run away from the coastline, Jeff. If you give us help long before it's airborne, you know. Because <laughs> it's going yeah. from species to species, so you... Yeah. Just like, what? And But yeah. there it is in both oceans, Atlantic and the Pacific, not just... On the coast of That's Spain, just too, spot, ladies right? and gentlemen. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And it happens to be to the only mussels that are the only species of mussels that are left on the coastline, conveniently. <laughs> Any bivalve. <laughs> I mean, they're missing feeling. from the coastline. It's yeah. It's down to one percent of a percent or something. Well, it's down to twelve species. When no you look out on that look, beautiful ahead, ocean, uh, you'll see, uh, in a manner of speaking, an ocean that is carrying infectious cancer now, not to mention radiation. Yeah, that's frightening. Like, if we had cancer in any other food, what would we do? We would freak out. Yeah. Uh, but for yeah. some reason, now, like I say, a friend of mine uh, was a mussel farmer here, still has uh, one or two. He's retired, though, but he called up uh, the mussel um, association that he's been dealing with for a couple of decades. They knew nothing about it. They got back. Come to on, seven, they knew about nothing seven, about it. Yeah, okay. no one told them. They got they pulled it up on the website and they got back to him seven days later because that's the first they heard of it, and that freaked them out. Don't don't get me wrong. I'm not I'm not uh, pinning for these people at all. Don't get me wrong either. But that's the fact. And uh, they got back to him and. Uh, 
that was basically the end of it. They they confirmed that that was true. That's what happened. But like you got all these muscle firms all around me. I mean, it's an incredible amount of these things. Hmm. And that product now has got cancer in what the FDA or the the, the food uh, and, and uh, administration yeah. here didn't step in. But yet here's studies. So it looks like the study was designed to get the children of uh, certain families not to eat the seafood and stay away from the shoreline. That's probably what it really was going on. But who knows, right? Well, I, I just find it hard to believe there's cancer. Uh, Yoshi, what, is, uh, what does this mean? Floating infectious cancer in the ocean. Well, you know, I mean, muscles, they, they communicate biologically, you know, uh, with each other. Uh, there's uh, sexual reproduction, so uh, it's not surprising that cancer cells are drifting between these animals and spreading, and into other species also. You know, they gather a lot of That's water. That's the bottom so line. Cells, yeah. Yeah, and then, uh, yeah, but uh, we got to remember, too, that cancer is opportunistic. This is just one of the downstream effects of radiation. These are all sick. Uh, as Dana points out, they're all sick animals to begin with from the radiation from Fukushima. Uh, so they're, they're already in the process of dying, and so they're just much more open to all sorts of infection, including they have no, the cancer they, cells from other, they got no, other yeah. uh, marine species. Yeah. Absolutely. They have no, 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 have no, I agree with your whole herd. Yeah. No immune yeah. system, yeah. no functional yeah. immune system. We're all in the same state, yeah. yeah we're we're well, much did, more open. I, I, there was a yeah. metaphor, basically, for them not saying radiation was an issue, was the issue, and caused yeah. these autoimmune deficiencies, yeah. or illnesses, and injuries. Right. Yeah. All right. I agree. That's smart thinking. Thank you for saying that. Let me uh, yeah. move on here. What I'm going to do is read uh, three emails I got from people who've been kind enough to write in to share their experiences with what Dana first discovered, that the insect population was virtually gone in British Columbia. And that has spread all across North America now. Here's one from uh, someone named Dana, and he writes, Anyone who has driven in California's Central Valley has known how messy your radiator, your chrome, your windows become as they get to the point where they are encrusted with hundreds of huge, juicy agricultural insects. In the recent past, a trip across the valley, this again the Central Valley, would mean a trip to the car wash. This past month, July 2016, I drove across the Central Valley from Yuba City to Clear Lake. No bugs. I drove down Highway 5 to Merced. No bugs. I drove back to Yuba City. My son and I laughed when one medium-sized bug hit the windshield near Stockton. One bug. Last year I had visits from about three mosquitoes. This year I saw only one mosquito. I don't see many birds now in the Sierra Nevada foothills. These forested hills previously teemed with bugs, birds, and critters of all kinds. As I walk along, I search for critters like ants, grasshoppers, and beetles. I very rarely see any. And I ask people to send these in to let us know what's happening in various parts of the country. Here's one from Oklahoma City. This is from Paul. Hi, Jeff. I live in Oklahoma City, and this summer we had ample rain. Everything is green and leafy, so there should be an abundance of bugs. Even in drier years, there can be plenty of them. But this summer, the bug count is well below what it has been in the past. On the property of the house where I live, we have two large night lights outside mounted on power poles. In summers past, there would be a cloud of bugs, insects, all around the lights, as well as the porch light at the front door of the house. You'd have to fight the bugs to get inside. Not the case this year. There are a few, but just a few. Even last year, there were more than now, and many more two to three years ago. So there you go. Thank you for all this and that. Thank you very much for that, Paul. That's enough. What I want to do now is uh, I got an email from a gentleman who is a professional long-haul trucker. And if you want to know what's happening in a country or any location, you can almost always ask a trucker. Those professionals understand uh, so much about this country. It's amazing. His name is Ray Lovett, L-O-V-E-T-T, -T, and he's standing by from somewhere right now. Ray, are you there, and can you hear me all right? Yes, Jeff, I can hear you just fine. How are you doing tonight? We're good, thank you. And uh, Yoshi, say hello to Ray. 
Yeah, hello, Ray. Uh, hey, Ray. So glad that you wrote in. So glad. Yep. Yeah, and Dana is here as well, Ray. Yeah, good stuff. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, I can go shoot with Dana. Ray, love it. Tell us, uh, tell us your experience in years gone by. What was it like to drive in the summers through various parts of the country and and look at the front of your your tractor uh, after how many hours and so forth? What what was it like before Fukushima? I want, one thing that I noticed is that they have uh, the uh, squeegees, you know, that you wash your windshields with and sure. all the truck stops. Yeah, yeah. And uh, used to, long time ago, they uh, they were all wore out. Uh-huh. And sure. They're, they're lasting a lot longer these days. <laughs> So uh, another thing that I <laughs> another ahead. thing that I noticed is uh, the dramatic decline in the fly population across the entire United States. Now that's coast uh, to coast, all the way. Coast to coast, yeah. Um, sure. The uh, one thing that I used to notice when you know, you'd be following behind a vehicle, the uh, blast of air that's created by the motion of, of a moving vehicle, you know? Uh-huh. It, for instance, when you would drive past, say, like a roadkill animal, right. you would see uh, hundreds of flies fly up off of that roadkill animal when that vehicle would go by. Right. You would see them fly up and land back down, look like a small little cloud. Mm-hmm. Not no more. Nothing. There, so you're saying yeah. on, on roadkill... There are no flying insects anymore like there used to be. I know what you're talking about. I've seen that very thing years and years ago, but I never thought to mention it to anybody. This is uh, not a good sign. Uh, I can say that this summer I have seen, honestly, about half a dozen flies the whole summer. That's it. There are no more house flies. There are no more flies hanging around outside. If something's dead outside, like a dead animal on the property... I mean, no flies. You're right. This is very interesting. Uh, Dana's seeing the same thing up there. Right, and you remember last fall I, I put a chicken leg, uh, a couple of them, out. That's the trailer, right, you and, did. And they lasted for months. Yep. Sorry. They, they lasted will. for months, huh? Yeah, they lasted for months, uh, <laughs> and no cats stole it, say. No birds came in and landed on it. There was no uh, amount of insects that like you couldn't go out and, and find insects, but a scatter time you might see one over the couple of months. But uh, it, it lasted for a couple of months, and I literally gave up on it. It got raining and buried or something. But I thought that was the strangest thing imaginable. I have reports from right across North America, and another uh, one that I caught tonight up on Canadian YouTube trending was uh, three uh, grizzly bears going after uh, pet ducks. Uh, the people had penned in on their property and they were the brazenest things I've ever seen in beers. I've never seen beers react like that. They got right in the beer's face with the vehicle, blowing the horn. The beer came right back through again. It, um, it took, a, say, 10 minutes for the beer's finally left and it wasn't willingly, but they definitely wanted those ducks extremely bad. And, like, I've been uh, doing a survey on the pond, a uh, 35-mile pond up here repeatedly, just the one pond, and the same area, go up and hit the same area over and over and over and over and over. And maybe the whole time, um, and one, two hour trips each time, maybe I've seen total six, seven insects and two birds. That is something unbelievable. That is inconceivable right through the middle of summer in the perfect conditions, shady side of the mountain. Yeah, no, we're seeing reports from right across the country. Now, I've done the whole coastline, and why uh, you were talking about. Uh, windshield washing and that we done Port Alberni for two days that stretch of highway where all the trucks are coming down through it's a 40 mile through uh, old growth some of these trees you can put something like 80 people inside of the tree these are huge trees and it's normally just maggoty insects uh, I couldn't find any on the side of the road except for a bee and a horse fly and the insects that I did find uh, around 30 species along the coastline and ended on that was the same species no matter where I went. I didn't find the extra species, and uh, there should be something 30,000 species along the coastline. Wow. We, dro- uh. we, we drove the whole coastline, once again, uh, on mm. top of that, and never 
had to clean the windshield a single time. Yeah, go ahead. Ray, what about uh, about the windshield on your on your rig and the front end? You're, you're talking about squeegees not being used much by truckers to clean their windshield. I guess that, that's that's the, that's well, the norm well, now. They're, they're used. You know, we, we have to we have to use them. Um, mm-hmm. But they're they're just there's no no bugs to clean off. But we we have to keep our windshields clear. You know, those are some of the laws. Right. Um. But with with no bugs, you're you're just you're you're cleaning already clean glass. Have any there, of the there's other? There's a few. You know, there's a, there's a few. You know, don't get me wrong. Um. But not not like it used to be years and years ago. Right. Well, are there any of the other uh, your colleagues in the field aware of this? Do they ever talk about it, or do you ask them? You, you notice about oh, the yeah. lack of bugs. <laughs> Tell me what's being said. Uh, well, that they've attributed it to everything from pesticides to global warming to <laughs> they just don't they just don't notice. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, but, but they yeah, are they are I, uh, noticing a lack of insects. They all are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, quite, quite a few people have noticed, and uh, I bring up the, the the flies. You know, uh-huh. have, have you seen the flies like, like it used to be? And and I'll be like, oh yeah, no, I'm you know I'm seeing a whole lot of flies or mosquitoes either. Uh, the the mosquito population is is non-existent. Um, I, I found a few pockets of of them across the country, um, mostly in the Arkansas, Louisiana, and the wetland areas. Uh-huh. But they they used to be uh, prevalent across the entire country, from coast to coast. Um, you couldn't go outside at nighttime w- without spraying yourself down. But n- not anymore. Now what? Uh, Ray, when you go up in the mountains, do you encounter them up in the, the top part of the mountains? As for Ray, does uh, uh, does elevation uh, make a difference, Ray? When the, the few you do see, are there more up at the higher elevations, or are they down at the lower elevations? Uh, the ones that I have found have been at, at sea level or or within 150 feet of sea level. Uh, okay. I haven't I haven't been up in, into the mountains here here How recently. About birds? And, you know, been able to stop yeah. or anything. All right, the next bird next question. Yeah, birds. What about birds? Uh, they've they've been dramatically reduced. I found a few pockets. What what I find really astonishing. I noticed this. I was in uh, you know uh, the the Great Salt Lake up by Salt Lake City, Nevada, uh, Utah. Mm-hmm. I spent a lot of time up there in, uh, back in 2012, and right. the seagull population, they were just millions of seagulls up there to the point where every evening you could see them circling the entire Salt Lake City area, and uh, to the point where it could become a hazard to aviation um, just wow. for a thousand feet in the air, uh, you know, all these seagulls and everything. I was up there the 4th of July. And I saw two seagulls, uh, and I was right on the shore of the Great Salt Lake. Um, I kind of attributed that to well, maybe it's because there's fireworks in the area, or, or what you know, what have you. Or there wasn't a whole lot of fireworks, but you know, a few people were shooting off fireworks out there. But I don't I think that was the answer, that. Ray. Oh. Uh, uh, this is uh, this is again another thing that D- Dana has seen many many times. No more seagulls, uh, Dana. Of course, they just migrated, right? Yeah, and yeah, that trend of birds coming more to the docks. That's <laughs> something we expect. I've been looking for. There was a lady up here too in British Columbia. Was chased by beers, by a beer, and uh, was chasing a dog rather. And then she was in the way, and the beer ended up uh, beating her up a little bit. Stitch wise, thirty stitches or something, but uh, my kid had last fall had to put down a beer. It was starving, and I seen a beer two nights ago, or maybe it was last night. Yeah, two nights ago, coming into my area, and he was ahead of me. He was uh, he wasn't very big, 
Uh, now, last year around this time, we were inundated with beers uh, going through everything. This year, we hardly, I think, two reports. You remember I was talking about it a lot last year, yeah. Jeff? Yeah. 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 So this year, only two reports. This is something I predicted, too. Last year, they were e- living on apples because uh, the mountains, the ice, the glacier ice is gone. And uh, that's why I was asking you, Ray, about the insects in the mountains. But uh, the glacier ice was gone. Is now this is number two year, three year almost uh, without the glacier ice. So the rivers, the estuaries, lake, the streams, all the insects that were completely dependent upon those estuaries, and um, they never responded because the rivers were too hot. They never got that cold glacier water regulating it the last couple of years, and then the salmon never made it up. So in three, four, five years, uh, that that alone would be devastating. Yoshi, what are you hearing about uh, the insect population in Japan? Are you getting any reports from anybody? Oh, uh, you know, yeah, same same pattern. It's been going on like a year after Fukushima, a vast reduction. And uh, what's interesting is that it's uh, it's all along the the uh, food ladder, the food chain. So you get moths and uh, butterflies, you know, outdoors a lot. Uh, uh, they're dead. But what's interesting about mosquitoes? And um, flies, they're, they're, they're basically one's a blood feeder, the other is a flesh eater, you know, of a soft tissue and carcasses as a, you know, right. forager. So, and one thing I do know about flies is that because I do development of natural pesticides against in, uh, mosquitoes and so on, flies are, uh, an, uh, they're, they're a genetic freak because uh, all other insects, we can kill them by knocking out their GABA, G-A-B-A gene, which controls the timing of their respiratory system. But flies are immune to that. So what that leads me to conclude is that ingestion of water, of food, has a lot to do with killing these insects. And it's very interesting about the roadkill, you know, uh, this sort of really stark situation where the flies really congregate there. You know, this is where they lay their eggs, the maggots grow. So they're obviously probably dying off in the maggot stage in the flesh of these animals, in the soft tissue of these animals. And so what it means is the grazing animals, the, you know, the, the wild animals that graze are the big source of blood and, and uh, you know, fuel for the eggs, for flies. Uh, that's where they're getting it. It's in the higher animals already. You know, in other words, if there were only mosquitoes and flies, I could assume, well, we mammals are pretty still pretty safe. That assumption is just blown away by what you're seeing about the absence of flies, these very, very hardy insects. No, oh, all right. Uh, Ray, any final comment for us tonight? This has been very helpful. And again, what you're telling us is pretty much coast to coast. It's not just in the Northwest. It's all over the place. Yeah, that, that's pretty pretty much it. Um, in the last couple of weeks, I've been everywhere from upstate New York all the way down across the southern states to Phoenix, Arizona, then back up to upstate New York. And uh, pretty much noticed the same thing all, all the way across. No moths. Um, at, at nighttime here in the truck stops, we have the uh, high-intensity lights, the overheads. Sure. And years years back, you could see just millions of moths and mosquitoes and everything surrounded those those lights. But yeah. not anymore. None. No, no more. Very few. Yeah, uh, same thing here. The service stations at night used to have swarms of insects around these. The lights, no more. They're gone. They're just gone. Ray, thank you very much. Uh, stay in touch. Maybe we'll talk to you again down the road here. And we appreciate the observations and, and you being on tonight. So take care. Drive carefully. Yeah, thanks, Ray. We'll do, Jeff. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you, Dan. You. Thank you. Thank you, Yoshi. Y'all have a good night. Thanks. Okay, well, there you go. Another uh, report from a man who who knows. Uh, Yoshi, you wanted to talk about steel. This is a very interesting subject, and so yeah. let's get into that. Set the stage for us here. Uh, briefly, uh, the French company EDF Energy France, uh, which is involved in this current controversy at Hinkley Point in, Br- in Britain trying to put in a major power plant, well, they just caught uh, a serious defect in the reactor cores that are being shipped from Japan to the Flammaville plant, which is being built in France. And their report has been very negative. They said that there's high concentrations of carbon inside part of that steel 
And as you know, I worked in uh, two steel mills at uh, yeah, uh, yeah. South Chicago South Works, yeah. and also at Republic Steel, Republic Steel in Gary, Indiana. So I seen the steel making, the pores, and all. You had to walk through all these plants. It's so cold in Chicago. You got to walk through all these plants to get to where you're going because it's off the lake. All the windows are broken. The wind was blowing. That plant doesn't exist anymore. That's the one Obama refers to. Mm. Anyway, what? I found out researching around is made by the, the, these cores are five tons, they weigh five tons of steel. Uh, it's a steel carbon mix. And what uh, you, you do is all, all steel is basically a steel carbon alloy, uh, carbon being the alloy in the steel crystals. Um, it's made in blast furnaces, okay, and, mo and modern steel mills use oxygen, so there's no contamination from air. And then the steel is poured uh, for casting once it's all, you know, mixed and melted and uh, it's all tested and so far. It, it's poured out and it's cast, okay? Now, what I found out that this company in Japan, uh, it's called Japan uh, Forging and Casting Corporation, and it's based in Kita, Kyushu. That means North Kyushu, the southernmost island in Japan, uh, very close to the Nippon Steel Company, one of the world's, at, at one time it was the world's largest steel company. It's formerly known during the war, so Amer many American veterans of World War II know it as Yawada steel. Yawada was basically built the entire Japanese Navy and Air Force in World huh. War II. It was made out of Yawada steel. Uh -huh. And including the battleship Yamato, another world's biggest you know, uh, 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 battleship ever. But anyway, uh, Kokura, that was uh, that, that, that was called a super battleship. And if you want to look up something, yeah. look up something super amazing, ship. look up the Yamato, I guess it was, uh, yeah. Yeah. super battleships of Japan. Yeah. Yeah. An enormous number of hits, yeah, from American uh, bombers, torpedoes, you know, before yeah. it went, finally went down. Yeah. But anyway, uh, the Iwata Steelworks was the target of the first, world's first plutonium bomb, which was dropped instead on Nagasaki, you know, the, the steel mill. Uh, if they knocked out Iwata, that's the end of Japan's war, war-making ability, okay? It's that big a, 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 a mill with that advanced technology, metallurgy, science, and all that. What happened, the workers there started a huge fire uh, using tar from the, uh, you know, when you make coke, a uh, very pure carbon out of coal, you get all this tar left over. They were burning these barrels of tar, which formed a huge toxic cloud over Kokura, and the American uh, bomber crew had to fly instead over Nagasaki and dropped it there instead. So this is a very historic place, you know, the steel making center, one of the most historic steel making centers in the world. Now I figured out there's a short distance between Nippon Steel where the um, steel is made, you know, the steel is uh, inside the blast furnace, and to where the uh, reactor cores are built, are forged, are basically cast and forged. So what's probably happened from what I can tell, there was not like this one huge bucket of steel that usually happens in these big steel plants like at South Chicago when it was operating where it directly pours in the casting. So you get very, very pure steel that's going right into the mix there. We were building uh, tankers for the Alaska pipeline at the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, this short distance means they probably send over a bunch of ingots from uh, smaller ingots from uh, Nippon Steel to the, the Japan Forging Company. These were remelted. Now the problem there when you remelt the steel is it gets exposed to air. You get nitrogen, and nitrogen really screws up the chemistry of these, uh, and that's why we use oxygen nowadays. It screws up the chemistry. So that's my guess, that somehow nitrogen got, uh, got in there, and uh, it failed to purge for the final purge of carbon. You know, carbon, when it comes out of a steel mill, is about 4%. You've got to purge it down by 1% or 2% to get... Uh, steel that is malleable. In other words, the more carbon you have, you've heard of carbon blades, right? Carbon yep. blades? Yep. Combat blades? The yep. more carbon you get, the sharper and stronger the steel gets, but it gets brittle. It gets to a point where it gets too brittle. So if you need steel that shrinks, you know, that's under a lot of heat pressure, shrinks and expands like a nuclear power plant, you've got to have malleability and less carbon. But it has to be evenly spaced around so you don't get, like, some parts expanding faster than the other, which will cause fragmenting. Now, the problem here at Flammaville, I think, is not just a one-off problem. It, it appears to be a very fundamental to the production of these nuclear cores. Now, there are 13 
reactor cores in Japan, two of them operational in Kagoshima right now at the Mitsubishi plant in Ka- uh, Kagoshima, uh-huh. which are made of, by the same process. Okay. These are 13 reactors at, at, at six nuclear power plants in Japan have these same design cores, these same forge cores. In France, you've got 18 reactors, and these are larger reactors. These, these are for larger reactors. 18 reactors at nine plants. Basically, we've got, what, 18 and 13? We've got, what, a 31 nuclear bombs ready to go off in France. Japan, and two of them operational in southern Japan. Wow. Good news. You know, More good news. Uh, you know, metallurgy, you know, uh, uh, chemistry. It's a basic chemistry problem, a metallurgy problem mm-hmm. in this steel, and it hasn't got a lot of citation. I'll try to send you some stuff when I have a little bit of time on this. Uh, it looks like a, a problem they can't fix. There is another reactor uh, core plant way up in northern Hokkaido, uh, Muruwan, it's a really weird place. It looks like, uh, you know, it's, you go through Hokkaido, nice green. You know, this is the northernmost island. It looks like Alaska, beautiful green uh, island there, forests and, and pastures and all that. And then you see something that looks like Mordor, totally black and grim industrial site, very old. So these are very old plants that are operating and making your nuclear power plants. And there are basic defects, basically, we're seeing which will lead to uh, fracturing, meltdowns, and further problems. And unless the nuclear industry is finally shut down, these problems aren't going to go away. They're not going to – uh, it's very, very hard. Now, the plants in China and Russia, okay, made there, they're welded together. <laughs> this, this is incredible. I didn't realize that. They're uh-huh. not a single port casting. Uh-huh. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't live next door to one if they're – well, I, I used to be a welder, you know. So these, <laughs> these, these reactor cores – are welded together. Yeah, the ones from China and Russia. So yeah. you know all the problems along the Alaska pipeline are leaking oh, bad weld. Of course. That. I mean, they, and, and they, welding also. Well, uh, whenever they build a the, nuclear plant, uh, they have to x-ray all the welds, theoretically, to yeah. check them to see if they're yeah. good inside yeah. and outside. Yeah. And this is not well, good news. I didn't know this that. This is not good news. And then the problem is not the weld. It's the metal next to the weld yeah, uh-huh. that's been burned and shrunk and this loss is uh, crystal structure, basically. It's, it's like crystal chaos in there, you know? So they don't, re- they don't x-ray that part, but they know darn well. That's the weak point. It's not the weld, but the metal adjoining the weld. Oh, if you go, let's say, another inch or two out, right. that's where you have an enormous weakness. So the nuclear industry is not playing with a full deck of cards. I mean, this is, like, so fundamental to the manufacturing process, you know? We wouldn't do this with diesel engines, you yeah? We wouldn't do this with your car engine. Look no. doing that with these bombs that they're planting around the world. That will destroy entire economies, destroy entire continents. Wow. Oh, the other problem, the other thing, uh, just, yeah, this is an astonishing thing, but I've noticed also a lot of articles on the Arctic now because it's near the end of the season, yeah? Right. And scientists and uh, tourist boats are coming back. And apparently the same problem in the North Atlantic, you know, the, uh, most of those are birds that eat fish, you know? Uh, that you know, from the Arctic region, Faroe Islands, you know, off Iceland right. and all that. Forty, like fifty percent, forty-seven percent declines in population. You know, so the bird kill off is really accelerating uh, globally. It's not just, you know, in the United States. And North nobody America. is talking about Europe. it except right here. Yeah, I don't know anybody yeah. else who's talking about this. And the wow. other thing I keep pointing out about the Arctic, Mom, this is important for Dana being, you know, Canada being an Ar- one of the five Arctic countries, is that climate change is being you know, is attributed as the cause, but there has been zero, not a single climate change model that predicted what would happen since 2011, this rapid collapse of the ice sheet and of the uh, you know, loss of the Greenland ice sheet, you know, the, the whole I- Arctic ice sheet and the Greenland glacier is being lost. Well, the, the, the Larson, the Larson sheet in the Antarctic uh, has a an eight. What is it? An eighty-five mile crack in it. It's it's moving. Yeah. It's breaking yeah. off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it could be just because of the atmospheric effects. Radiation is spreading uh, to the other side of the planet too, along the electromagnetic, uh, you know, bands uh, along the Earth. So, so the Arctic issue, and I hope Dana, you can give a little bit of attention. Uh, Canada being an Arctic uh, power, you know, one of and one of the great Arctic powers, uh, with along with Russia and Alaska, United States got Alaska. Um, 
and then Denmark, obviously, you know, uh, because of Greenland, yeah, that, um, you know, that, that uh, we've got to look at the reports coming in from the Arctic this autumn. You know, a lot of reports will be issued, and again, against that climate change model. Yeah. You know, clim- climate change, James Hansen. And James Hansen had wrote a book, and then uh, 350.org was started up based up on that book by another person, and then they have 7,500 chapters. Uh, and so it's all based, that one, that part of it is, if you want a real climate change, I can show it to him in a heartbeat. And so it's all based up on this fable and tin cans and pop bottles and cardboard. But like the grazing on the animals you were talking about, that's, uh, that was the big one, wasn't it now? Because like the animals in Fukushima Prefecture, they can migrate out and then it's legal to kill them and eat them. But, uh, and, and it's absolutely an atrocious that somebody did eat them. And the, um, the lap, uh, I can't remember. You remember the reindeers in um, uh, yeah, in Norway. Yeah, in, in Nor- Norway. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, no, these are the uh, antelope in Kazakhstan. Wiped 120,000 of them. Half the national third, uh, herd along the steppe just wiped out, like in a week, you know, or less, in days, actually. Yeah. I think it was days. Hey, uh, yeah. when you're talking about those reactors, Yoshi. Uh, hmm? So when you're talking about that metal, is not the proper. Uh, mixture is not the proper uh, well the, the metal integrity. pieces are yeah the metal pieces are the ingots are, are exact but when you okay. remelt you know right. metal right. is right. basically a new crystallization process and any deviance in there and nitrogen is a big deviant thing the and thing how then Wigner, so how does Wigner affect huh? all of that how does the Wigner effect of the radiation affect that I wonder well, so there's, well, a, there's an effect uh, you know go ahead well, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you have more carbon in the steel, and we're just talking about a half a percent or, you know, a small percentage, a half a percent or a percent, that part of the steel will become more brittle. So when the reactor is heated, it will expand. And then when, you're, and when you pull the fuel out for servicing, there's a vast reduction in temperature, okay? And so it will right. contract that reactor core. You do that a few times, you're going to get cracked. And as we know, most reactors, all the reactor in the world, are completely cracked. And this explains why, you know, that steel... They're all on life support, every one of them. They're well, all past yeah. their prime or even past exactly. their life expectancy. And then that Wigner effect, that the integrity of the entire facility has to go to a nuclear waste site because it's radiated. And also that Wigner yeah. effect itself is really bad stuff. Explain the Wigner effect again so we all know. So what it breaks down... The atomic on the atomic level on one one ten thousandth of a billionth of a meter, it breaks it down the, uh, to the point where it's ca- kind of like what uh, Yoshi's talking about. It becomes brittle, uh-huh. but on top of that, it becomes highly radiated from the neutrons and the gamma showing and the X rays and everything else. But this effect, um, you know, it showed it can show up in weird places from radioactive fallout like car windshields in the city down in the States, a uh, nuclear power company had to pay for all the car windshields because of a release from the reactors. They didn't admit to, uh-huh. but they admitted to the damage of hundreds of car windshields that were destroyed mysteriously over a short period of time. And this was by the radiation, uh, high dosage come out, but they never ever admitted to it. But uh, the reactor buildings, the integrity of the buildings are, are very vulnerable to that this is why yeah. it had a shelf life of about 35 to 40 years, and that was it because of that particular yeah. issue. Yeah, there yeah you would get a lot of, uh, lot of uh, let's say, uh, mutation in the metal and the steel. So basically yeah. when it gets created, uh, you right. know, uh, protons are displaced in the iron, and then you will get, or the carbon, and you will get uh, all kinds of weird uh, byproducts, you know, nuclear radioactive byproducts. Uh, and so those would be points of weakness depending on what they are. So yeah, instead of steel breaking, it would turn the dust down the road. Say you would crack it, and instead of steel just breaking because of brittleness over yeah. a long period of time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It was so a very the, strange the, the radioactive bombardment, yeah, that's unrelated to this particular problem. This problem is just the structure of the reactors is flawed. You know, it's like that's a, what I'm saying. Both of these like a light bulb with a crack with a very thin crack in it, something like that. So it was a very weak yeah. point. Mm-hmm. Right. And then you put that weakener effect at it, and that makes it exactly. that much more likely to have an issue. Much more absolutely. likely to have what yeah. you're talking absolutely. about. Absolutely. True, unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely. If uh, anything happens there or in the surrounding area, you're going to have massive uh, 
massive weakness showing up and then fragmentation, you know, fracturing. And if that happens during a run, you know, late night and the guys are just sort of nodding off over their coffee, you have a meltdown, basically. It's, hey, you know, uh, it, it only, only, what do you think about Japan is actually fairly clever. Only 10% of them would go back. The other 90% wasn't stupid enough to go back. That shows you what the society truly is like, right? In, in close to Fukushima oh. Prefecture? Only 10%. Again, yeah, That's a lot good. of people who did go back noticed exactly what you were even saying. No insects. I mean, these are farm folk, right? They live in a rural area. Well, no insects, no animals. You walked along the shoreline of California on top yeah, of that. Yeah. On top of everything else. Yeah, I mean, I walked along the Fukushima shoreline. It's, See, you know, when I'm just what I was going to say. Number washed up dead, you know. And unfortunately, this had something to do with radiation. My instruments were dead. My camera wasn't taking pictures. You know, I lost huh. the camera, even the computer. I lost everything. I must have got massively. And this was the wow. southern part of Fukushima and the, off of Tokyo. But it was where the ocean currents and fogs were really heavy, you know, where Tokyo wow. uh, got clobbered through that trench. So you know, all my instruments went down, and all I could do is, you know, just visual. I mean, just record in my notes what I was seeing. It was just an incredible apocalyptic event on by the shore. Yeah. Time, and that was in the run, summer. Run. Uh, that was so, September 2011. So wow. it was rapid. You know, the onset of this hit was rapid. You know? so, right, so let's, let's, sailors watch the mass impact. Time. Let me uh, let me ask uh, exactly the point. Yeah, yeah. As you said about the Ronald Reagan, all the wristwatches of these people stop. It's right. really weird yeah. how your electronic instruments, though especially more sensitive ones without a lot of shielding and all, they just go right down. And you think, oh man, what you know? Uh, you know, I'm long past the warranty. What went wrong? I should have gotten new. It, it, it's just clobbering everything at once. You know, my I lost a couple of three thousand dollar Geiger counters. You know. Oh, as a result. Even Geiger hmm. counters were hit, you know, stuff they use for uranium mining. That's insane, right? That is insane. <laughs> so, I, yeah, and I wasn't feeling too good after that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> no. Let me ask, uh, we got a few minutes left here. Let me ask hey, about... screaming like a little girl. No offense to little girls. Yeah, that's all right. It's, uh, it's worth it. The I Great would... Ice Wall, Yoshi. Oh, yeah. A joke from the beginning. Yeah. yeah, well, August 17th, typhoon number seven called Omai, Omaius. You won't find much information about it. Flooded the Fukushima site. Uh, apparently, water came up to the surface. Radioactive water came up to the surface of the plant. And uh, passed. And it was a very fast-moving uh, typhoon. It went past. It just flooded the whole area. And the ice wall immediately ceased functioning. And then uh, a bunch of water, you know, a bunch of uh, water just, burst out of there. It's like that. What's the little Dutch boy story? If he wasn't there to plug the dam yeah. with his finger, the, the, the dike. dike would have just exploded with uh, all this water pouring out vertic uh, uh, horizontally. You know? That apparently happened and it just like did apparently uh, some serious damage to the ice wall, maybe even to some of the equipment. Then, uh, as you notice, there was a second typhoon that came two weeks later you know? and uh, really hammered northern Japan, flooded, killed a lot of people. And that affected Fukushima. They're not even reporting that one. You know, they've gone, Fukushima, uh, TEPCO has gone silent on that. The ice wall is basically history. As I predict, I said, you know, the rainy season and the typhoon season were, were what's going to show the vulnerability of the ice wall. That was a bad idea. It was a boon. Those storms are um, radiation storms. These are real Thanks. bad to be out exposed into. They They're liberating everything, yeah. Absolutely. There absolutely are three typhoons who went in that direction, all passed in the vicinity of Fukushima. They're radiation storms. They're attracted by the electromagnetic energy pouring out of that plant. They're picking it and, up uh, and they're beaten, just like uh, a yeah, nuclear yeah. waste site is beaten. Exactly. Yeah, just Radioactive me, like, storms. I thought about yeah, this about it before. Those ice walls, you know, whatever, if somebody gets drunk and turns it off. Oops. Yeah, whoops. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's apparently universe. not, I don't think they can fix it. From what I read, it sounded yeah. like it was pretty well trashed. Yeah. Well, the my, problem my also the ice wall, it consumes so much power. You know, it's emitting power through the ground and the water, okay, electrical current, you know? Right. That's acting like a massive magnet for these typhoons. You want to bring on the typhoon, start up something as insane as oh, an ice wall. Interesting. You know, like I, I the thought water, they were going to build the ice wall around TEPCO, but they would turn it around the reactors. 
It would it would have worked around. No, no, no it's, it's behind. Right now, the ice wall is functioning behind the reactor because the water is coming off the uh, Abukuma Plateau. Right. So the idea of the ice wall will divert the water from underground, the the, the groundwater around the plant. Okay, that was the idea. Uh, the one facing the sea is not too functional. They, they've had a lot of problems with that because of contamination of seawater coming in. So the one behind the plant is the one that is uh, that has failed. So the water is now just surging groundwater into the new uh, Fukushima plant and just right. spouting out of the ground. And you know, but the power for that thing is massive. So that might actually be contributing to the attractor force of uh, for these typhoons to target that area. Radioactive storms targeting this massive elect, uh, electromagnet, basically a vast electromagnet in the ground there in Fukushima they installed. So they they spent you know uh, 250 billion a million dollars uh, only to make the situation worse. Uh, the storm that hit the Philippines took out 41 provinces was yep. uh, 200 yep. mile an hour, 195 steady, 225 yep. gusts. Yep. This lasted yeah. uh, three hours, 100 miles wide. Yeah. Both of those typhoons yeah. originally converged over Japan, over Fukushima, yeah. and then went to the Philippines yeah. on to Vietnam after. Yeah. That yeah. was really something. Well, that, that, that yeah, there amazing. is a massive amount of radiation, because I've, 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 I've mentioned before, I track these dumps from small fishing port, uh, ports where they dump massive amounts of high-level uh, nuclear waste into the Japan Trench. Mm -hmm. And maybe even directly into the Philippine Trench, the towing barges and sinking them. But the Japan Trench is connected Eesh. with the Philippine Trench, so we will get massive amounts of radio. It's sucking up all that stuff from the. Didn't mean to cut you off. It's sucking up all that stuff from the incinerators, all that ash and that from all those dumps. Yeah, yeah, it's liberating yeah. all that back into the environment at the same time. Really, something yeah. else. It's horrible. Yeah. The, the releases, the releases are incredible. I mean, the the, the quantities we're talking about, because what we see published, yeah, I, I think is a fraction of what really went on. If if my I'll reading, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example because I know we're short on time. Uh, in, uh, in 1945, they they went into the middle of the Pacific and they dumped 14 curries into the ocean, all the way to the middle. They dumped 14 curries. Now, 14 curries is one-sixth of a gram. And yeah. so they're not telling us the truth, no. That's a lot. When, what, yeah, and so like a lot. No, I'm a, a gram, a gram would have ocean. 88 curries. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, and so a pound, you know, yeah. is a lot of gram. But uh, this is what I'm saying. They don't tell you the truth. That was the official number. But when you actually done yeah. the mat on on uh, 14 curries, is one sixty one-sixth of a gram. And so you know they're lying. Yeah. But it looks like a lot. When you when you look up the original yeah. number, until you consider what it takes to make a gram. <laughs> Lion, disgusting, demented people. Yeah. Well, you went all the way into the middle of the Pacific to dump a sixth of a gram. Yeah, exactly. Uh, They're dumping barrel Congress, after barrel. Congress is like, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. was con yeah, congressional they, records. They, they, yeah, no. I told that to Congress laughed and said thank you. Stuff. So this so far, uh, again, let me point out that nobody that I have come across in these so-called alternative media is talking about radiation, Fukushima, no. extinction, no bugs, right. no birds, nobody. And they're here. They're listening to this program, but they will not talk about it. I'm not saying they're afraid to. It's I'm taboo. just saying it's not a priority for them. It's taboo, I guess. Or it's just yeah, that too. Again, they're not able to. Uh, they're not able to wrap their mind around it. No. All, they they don't uh, want to. They're besieged by enough stress. They don't want to take on any more. This would be too much for yeah, a lot of them. Yeah, you can't blame people. I get it. I definitely get that. No. I uh, but I, 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 not to the point where I'm not going to try to shove it down their throat. Well, that's what it's going well, to take. I, I feel the same way, Dan. It's like, you know, we've said a lot. Take it or leave it. And, but don't go complaining to us later on, you know, about what happened to your kids or your pet or yourself. You know, I mean, just, you know, that's my attitude, you know. I kind of lose my sense of charity. You know, I went to Fukushima and, and provide herbs to people, advise them to leave. Many people didn't. They got better for a little while, then they died. You know, what am I supposed to make of it? You know, you can give, you're like a doctor giving people a good prescription, good medicine, and good uh, health advice, and they right. don't take it. They go right back to, no. you know, smoking a cigarette again, right? I mean, so what can I do? You know, don't, like, don't bother me with the facts. My mind is made up. There I is think we're, I think we're just, we all have to 
prepare for the future and we have to be prepared to yeah. help everybody understand this and, and we become better yeah. every time we try and that I think we're well, part we of the cycle that has to be there yeah we we do try but their freedom of choice is I think misguided they take it very personally it is. so oh, it is I don't not. really have a reason to live no, anymore is. but they're not thinking of grandchildren other people you know animals oh, no. they're not thinking eight of eight million no, no. other species oh, on the planet no Nope. Exactly. That's totally what I mean. Right. It's like you, it's not just one's own personal choice. You know, the I don't, I don't know life on this planet rests on every person's shoulders. Every human being, it's especially all, since our species is so destructive, every human being has part of that weight of eight billion species on his or her shoulders, and that's what it's we're trying to. Obligation. That's right. Thank you. Exactly, stewards of the earth and all that. Right. I mean, huh. that's the problem. Are, are we worthy? Uh, I don't think so. Not anymore. Thank you, uh, Dana. You take care. Talk to you next sure. week. Thank you, folks. Thank you. All right. Good, good, good luck next week, Dana. Good luck next week. Yeah, we'll do the this radio show so the day before trial. So we'll do the next radio show. I'll be okay. down there. The yeah, day but uh, keep your spirits up. <laughs> this is a hard time for all of us. All oh, yeah. of us who are critical. I got me battle, you know, it's a I tough got me battle time. slippers on. Yeah. yeah. I do so. Yeah, but we're with you a thousand percent and wish we could do more to help. I know. Yeah, that's what gives me the strength. Trust me. Hugs okay. Everybody. All right, Dana. You take care. You too. And Yoshi, you take care of yourself. Uh, All right, good. You, nice, be sir. careful of some of those strange people across the street who are staring at you. You know. Oh yeah, they're they're they're, they're no longer across the street. You know, let's put it that way. You know. Uh, I yeah, figured. they're creeping up the back steps. Anyway, uh, we we continue this battle as best we can. With All what right. Little we got. Thank you. Okay. You be well. All right. There goes uh, Yoshi and Dana, and thank you for being here. That's our Monday night, and. Uh, didn't get any more controversial than what we covered tonight. Back tomorrow night. Hope to have your presence. Take care. Have a good day. And we'll talk soon.